100 Ottoman hook blade has two parts, you see. You see. What's up, everybody? I'm the blade. And I'm the hook. And together we're, you know. Welcome to the Hook Blade Hook Blade, a show about all things Assassin's Creed. I'm your host, Lawson, and with me, as always, is my co host, Tim. Tim, listen, I, I hate to start the episode on such a dark note, but I think it's time for you to come clean. Okay. The, the listeners don't know this, but you have a, um, a really big secret that, if revealed, it could, could damage your reputation as a, as a host of this podcast. You yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. But I, I've come to realize that there's no way we can properly address this topic and set it up without this coming to light. Well, should I just, should I just rip the bandaid off? I mean, take your time, do what's comfortable right. for you, but, but whenever you're ready. Well, I shouldn't have, I, I probably should have been more upfront about this and it makes me, you know, a little ashamed, you know, I, I've been losing mm-hmm. sleep over it and I've been telling you this outside of the podcast, yeah. but yeah, I, I, I'm just going to say it, you know, I, I don't follow to roll. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I haven't for a very long time. Tim, this isn't the secret. <laughs> <laughs> do you wait? Do you know what I'm actually talking okay, also, about? Also, I haven't played Origins <laughs> or Odyssey. Wow, wow! Why don't you follow to rule? Uh, He's been saying know. such nice things about the podcast. <laughs> well, he okay. Well, look, he doesn't follow me either. Also, you don't know this, and I'm probably going to edit this out unless there's a post about it. But he just told us he's stepping down as the head mod. Really? Yeah. Oh shit! So you don't. You maybe don't even need to follow him now. <laughs> 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 well he's still a mentor he is and he's still a great guy and we're yes. sad to see him step down yeah i don't know many natural blondes in my life but he's one of them ghost leader bg is stepping up to fill those massive shoes and i think he's gonna do a great job but yeah so you have not played origins or odyssey yeah um I, I really once I, I started seeing content for origins come out it to me it was a clear departure from what the series in my eyes, was going. Yeah. And I just didn't have much interest in playing it. I know Origins is, is a lot of a lot of people really like it. And I'm <laughs> glad about that. It just doesn't represent an Assassin's Creed game that I want to play. Yeah. And it got worse with Odyssey. Hey, um, and I don't think you should feel too bad about it because there's a lot of prominent community members who haven't played them. Um, I know Arachli hasn't played Odyssey ever and he doesn't want to ever. Yeah, I mean, Origins is the one that I would consider... Yeah, um, I pretty much know. One. I pretty much know it's like, um, I pretty much know its contribution to the story. But Odyssey, you know, I mean, you've you've talked about this at length on your YouTube channel. It's just, it goes so far back, you yeah. know, before man is created, <laughs> to tell a story that has dialogue choices, and so it's just not my thing. So look, the reason this is important to address in this episode and not any other episode we've done is because we're doing something actually really kind of interesting and unique and also cool and funny and handsome with this episode, um, where we we realized that we wanted to talk about the modern day. We wanted to talk about its, you know, its shortcomings, its, its elements, the things that we like to see from it, the things that we don't, the modern days that we like. But we realized that both of us had these particular gaps in our knowledge about the modern day. So I haven't read past the first, like, Assassin's comic, the first Assassin's and Templar arcs. I never read Uprising, and I also knew that Tim hadn't played Origins or Odyssey, so he's completely unaware, for the most part, of what's been going down in the modern day on that side of things. So we thought, wouldn't it be kind of delightful to have Tim explain to me what happens in Uprising, which I have no idea what happens and then for me to explain the modern day of the games to him and just get up to speed for each other um, on what's actually happening in the modern day story so we can talk about why it sucks, why it's really, really bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I also had it read Uprising, so I had to read Uprising to fucking, like, you know, get an idea about... Because I had but read you Assassins. Knew, you knew, like, the broad strokes. Because, okay, f- 
for yes. me, and this is probably some important backstory. I cared a lot in the in the games about the Juno plot thread of like, okay, you know, we set it up in AC3, Desmond's dead, Juno's been unleashed upon the world. Game by game, you're unlocking more information about Aita, about the sages, about the instruments of the first will. And then Syndicate comes out and it's like, it has this whole World War One riff dedicated to catching you up to speed on who Juno is and what she wants and what she's doing. And I was excited because it was pretty much at that point the only overarching plot thread to be found anywhere in Assassin's Creed modern day. So then I found out that Origins wasn't going to address it at all. And I found out quite a bit later that they had actually wrapped up the plot line in a comic book called Uprising. And I was so frustrated that they did that just completely off screen of the games that I pretty much never read it out of uh, out of protest. Right. And I but I uh, as opposed to you, I did know kind of the bullet points of what had happened because uh, I, you know, I, I just read about it and stuff. And I had read Assassins, unfortunately. Yeah. And uh, this isn't much better. Uh -huh, OK, so uh, and, and there OK, so there's 12 issues. Yeah. And I'd say at most there's about two issues worth of actual story that happens. OK, there's a lot of meandering. So it won't take me forever to explain it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of garbage. There's a lot of excess fat. I gotta trim off the steak. Yeah, there's so, a lot of there's a lot of um, filler for sure. All right, so give me the you know walk me through it, okay? Because again, I just want to reiterate the day of recording today is is July twentieth of the year of our Lord twenty twenty, and I have no idea in my entire brain what the hell happened to Juno. I don't know. Okay, so essentially, the book starts, and as far as I'm concerned. Or not concerned, but as far as I'm aware, it takes place in 2017. Mm -hmm. So, so around the same time as Origins, right? So basically, uh, Charlotte Day of the Cruise, everyone's favorite. Oh, character. I remember her. She's doing this mission. The book starts, and this is already where it was starting to lose me because Charlotte jumps out of a 30 story window, and they make sure to specify it is a 30 story window, and lands She's in a being... haystack. No, she lands on the top of a vehicle. And there's no explanation of, like, hey, she's running this specific tech, or she had a parachute, or whatever the fuck. She just hits the van, and she's okay. So already, you know, this this this, this is a cartoon. In its defense, the Assassin's Creed franchise has been stretching believability on height of jump for its entire <laughs> life. But, but I, if it was a haystack, I'd forgive it. But it's, <laughs> it's the top of a fucking vehicle. <laughs> All right, I'm with you. I think and that's she just dumb. rolls off like no, like nothing happened. Like like so that that so anyway. Thanks to just, this Volvo a, for breaking my fall. Yeah, it's a literal, it's a literal fucking, it's a literal cartoon. All right. So anyway, so basically we meet like the usual spe uh, suspects pretty much in this book. There's Kiyoshi. Yeah. Um, to my understanding, is 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 in uh, uh, Origins or Odyssey. He is, or, he is in Odyssey only by voice. And then you have Chet. Chet. Um. Ch it's yeah, and then you got Galena, All everyone's right. favorite. Everyone loves Galena, and you got and you got your favorite Michelle. It, okay, so that's Michelle from AC Gold. <laughs> yes. How similar <laughs> is her personality to how she is in AC Gold? It's it's honestly it's not even the same. Like she's not much. She doesn't do much here. She's he's, she's an assassin in training. Wow. Okay. And so as we know, she was a former Yurdito. So. She's getting uh, punched around by Galena, and that's about it for what's going on with Michelle in this in this in this book. Yeah. So Charlotte is getting her ass kicked by this guy, and she realizes, wait a second, this dude's an assassin. What the fuck? <laughs> and um, they they kind of reveal this later, but if you could tell, like, if the art was at all um, like correlated with how the characters actually used to look, you would be able to know. But all the characters just look like new versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. So the guy who is fighting her and who's also an assassin, um, I'm going to fucking butcher his name. But it's, uh, let's see, let me try here. Uh, Jazz Dip Dami. Say again? Uh, Jazz Dip Dami. All right. <laughs> he, was the, he was the brother and from Brahmin. The brother of? Of the sister who got killed. Oh, cool! Yeah, so he's in this book. Oh, nice! I like <laughs> but that. But he's 
But he's 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 the, he's like defected from the assassins. Really? He I mean, is an instrument of the first will. I guess that makes sense. But does it? Okay, he's an instrument of the first will. You're saying right. So the instrument of the first will has now become a like third faction. Cool. So they are they are made up from Templars and assassins alike right because there's still like violet da costa running around with them right yes does she turn yeah. up in the book she does turn up in the book cool. yeah, yeah but 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 like other templars aren't don't know that she is an instrument right she's being kind of she's being subversive she's yeah she's being very coy and grammatica pops up but he's not oh. even so much of he's just a wacky scientist that wants to see what happens yeah he is he's not, though he's that's not him. so much what that's, I mean, that's kind of how he was in Syndicate, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I'm just saying, like, he's not an instrument. He's uh -huh. just he's just there for the fun. Is he still working for Abstergo? Yeah. Okay, cool. Because basically the instruments pop up and they're like, yo, Grammatica, we want to take we want to take advantage of this Phoenix project you got going. Yeah. Because they have a piece of the shroud and all that. So anyway, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So mm -hmm. um, they're getting attacked from the, by, by, by the instruments and they're like, what the fuck? And so Otto Berg, everyone's favorite Templar, everyone's favorite Templar, pops up and he's like, "Yo, what the fuck's going on here? This, you know, why was there such a scuffle here?" Yeah. And so Otto Berg is the modern day Black Cross. Yeah. And okay, they referenced that in Odyssey, and I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> okay, cool. So essentially, there's only been one Black Cross before. The one and, in the 40s or whatever? Yeah. Albert I read Bolden. that. I read that comic. I think I liked it when I read it. Yeah. So essentially, it was, the it had Cross, the, Dennis Calero was the artist and writer, I think. Yeah. Right? I, I know he did the art. I'm not sure if he did the writing, though. It was a good comic. So basically, the Black Cross is, a, is like the Templar equalizer. Yeah. He makes sure the Templars are doing what, you know, they're, they're, they're doing their shit, right? So Otto Berg is like, yo, so, something's fishy. Mm -hmm. so he puts on his he puts on his um black cross outfit and he just and he starts investigating and he realizes that this goes on both sides this is this is a templar and assassin operation from a third party yeah and so he finds people who are who are aligned with assassins who are working with assassins but they're not assassins you know they're they're just posing as assassins and so that's that's how you get people like um just deep just dip i'm so sorry if i'm saying it wrong and <laughs> Um, and, uh, all that. So it's essentially like, you don't know who you can trust. And Otto Berg d d doesn't really trust anyone in this book. And so Charlotte g gets into the animus and she is able to relive an old first Civ memory. And if I'm understanding it right, it's because of her time with Consus that she's able to access this memory to kind of explain it like Juno allowed her to see this memory because okay. it's a little convoluted but so anyway she sees this memory and it's actually this actually the best part of the book okay. where it's his first of memory and Minerva is like yo these humans they're actually kind of cool mm -hmm. you know they're gonna like kill us if we keep locking them up like this <laughs> and <laughs> and then literally <laughs> As she says that, a, a guy comes out and he's like, oh, death to all of you. And he fucking stabs <laughs> Juno's dad. Aww. And so Juno is like, no, I hate humans. I hate humans. Humans. I hate humans. Friendship ended with humans. <laughs> Juno did not like that. Ah, oh, wow. There's a bunch of Juno content in the Odyssey DLC that I completely missed because... I also didn't play the DLC, <laughs> but like I, I was skipping through a video that was explaining or not explaining. That was literally just all the cutscenes from the Odyssey DLC. And like, you're literally in Olympus with fucking Poseidon and Hades. And then Juno shows up with Aita and they're like throwing shit at, at the gods. I, I really got to look into <laughs> what the hell's going on there at some point. I wonder if that stuff is like before or after. The humans have fucked up her dad. Yeah. So, essentially, Charlotte knowing this, Charlotte knows what Juno wants, and she's like, well, that's going to be, like, the ending of humanity. Because, essentially, the instruments are, like, culty, and they're just, like, they want the world to burn so that it can start anew. Yeah. Which is essentially what was going to happen in AC3 in if Desmond hadn't of put <clears throat> his hand on the pedestal. 
Yeah. So uh, Charlotte's like, whoa, okay, so we got to warn the Templars. Mm-hmm. So we got a bigger Otso, threat now. Otso, yes, yeah, yeah. So Otso Berg shows up at their fucking hideout. And then we get kind of a cute little, like, Otso Berg working with the assassins. That sounds fabulous. And, and so he's like, yeah, like, we need to fucking kill these guys. And they're like, yeah, we need, but I'm going to fucking kill you first. And he's like, no, I'm going to kill you first. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just bickering. And it actually is kind of funny, though, because Otso Berg actually is written pretty well in this book. And, and so, like, yeah. for instance, he walks in on Galena um, interrogating one of their crew members that turned out to be an instrument. Mm-hmm. And she's interrogating him. And he's like, wow, it's nice to be up here on the moral high ground with you guys. <laughs> So there's there's some nice like you know there's some nice jabs like especially that considering this. Galena like high kicked his chin off or whatever in syndicate yeah, dude, she right fucked him up she, yeah because she when whipped they meet, his ass when they meet she's like hey we didn't finish our talk Otso <laughs> so it's kind of cute seeing them like interact in like a passive aggressive manner like that your your DMs to me while you were reading these comics made me think wow these fucking suck but like what you're saying right now so far makes me kind of want to read them. But trust me, I'm giving you like the best of the best. All right, it's very I'm ready. few and far between here. I'm ready. I'm waiting so, for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> okay, so basically, yeah. So Violet the Costa, fuck her. Um, <laughs> she's an instrument, and basically, there's a there's kind of a little historical plot which kind of follows the old Black Cross. I don't give a fuck. Neither should you. It doesn't matter. So basically. <laughs> Guess what else pops up in this book? What? The Koai Noor Diamond. Yay! So that is essentially what Juno wants to get her fucking hands on. Really? She wants his diamond. Really? Because if she gets the diamond, she can take back essentially all of the pieces of Eden. <laughs> okay. I guess that's the idea. That's what that, that's kind of what they float around. And by the way, if I'm wrong about any of this stuff, be sure to comment in, in, down below about it. Um, if you're familiar from Syndicate as well, yeah, we did see these like fucking test tubes, yeah, of of like little like you know a uh, uh, fucking tube babies, yeah. So tell me about that. they uh, Otto Berg and the assassins are able to track down where the diamond was last by going through Charlotte's memories and Otto Berg's memories too. Oh, they actually like go through their memories in the Animus. Yeah, cool. but it's. It's, it's just, it's, uh, so. <laughs> Guys, Tim's sanity is unraveling moment by moment. <laughs> because, because the Black Cross was, you know, was keeper of the Koi, Koi near, no, no, no. The Koi so, Yes. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, fuck, dude, this is where the, this is where it is. We gotta go get it before they get it. Okay. And so they're like, yo, let's go get this diamond, dog. Yeah. And they all suit up and they go to Australia, the Australian desert. And they're like, yo, we're going to get this diamond. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, the instruments of the first bill show up with uh, old assassins and Templars alike. And on the inside of their base, on the outside, they're all battling. Kiyoshi is shooting people and, you know, there's a bunch of action going on. And so on the inside of the base, and something I haven't said to you, guess, guess, who, they, guess, guess who they have on their side right now who elijah miles Ooh. who's like like eight years old he's he's not old but he's an instrument of the first will no because they kidnapped him and they brainwashed him oh that's cool i like so that. he's like he's like yo like i want to bring juno back dog <laughs> <laughs> little eight-year-old elijah's like yo can we get juno back please dude he's literally like a psychopath Oh my god! He's like he like talks to himself. That's and he's so like, cool. "Yo, I'm gonna stab this bitch." <laughs> That's like, so interesting to me. So, yeah, because I is. always theorized that when they wanted to do a real soft reboot, they would essentially just take Elijah and put him in the same position as Desmond. So, like putting some legwork into having a very different experience for him seems like a smart and good thing to do. That's better than what I would expect him to do. Tell me why it's stupid. Well, it's just because like. I, I mean, there might have, it's just, they don't, uh, they don't build on his, he doesn't have a character. He's just a little boy and, and he's an okay. instrument of the first will, but like, I guess it's fine if they're setting it up for something later. Right. But basically what, okay. So, well, here's why it's stupid. So basically this whole time they've been like 
they, they need Gravatica's help. They need the use of the shroud because they're gonna put Juno in a body. Yeah. So they put Juno in a body, and she's in a body. Yeah. She she walks out of the tank. It, she's back. It's Juno. She's, she's like, what's she's up? Back alive. It's your boy Juno. And Juno, what it is? Consus is a part of her <laughs> because they used the shroud to bring to, to to speed up the process. I'm not even gonna pretend to understand that, but continue. So, so Juno's like, yo, like. All right, you guys are gonna die now. <laughs> so she like she blasts Kyoshi and, and Chet, and they oh. fall to the ground. And uh, Elijah is like, "Yo, like I actually don't really like you, Juno." <laughs> and so he like uses the diamond against her. He's like, "She's like, I want that diamond," and he's like, "Yeah, no, I'm not gonna give it." To you. <laughs> and Charlotte, <laughs> and so in in that moment. <laughs> Charlotte's like, yo, I'm going to stab you. And she stabs Juno. That's it. She's dead. <laughs> she falls to the ground. It's over. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> That's it. That's all you get. <laughs> oh, my God. And and also, though, the fucking like building collapses on Charlotte, so she's dead. Why didn't she, if she could just blast Kiyoshi and the other guy away, why didn't she just blast Charlotte into another zip code? It, <laughs> you're not supposed to think about, about that. <laughs> <laughs> she's distracted by Elijah, because Elijah's like, you want this diamond? Well, you're not getting it. He's playing keep away with the corridor. <laughs> yeah, it, so essentially, um, Elijah is mad. Because he's like, you killed my, you killed my mom. Yeah. Not to Juno, because Juno didn't. But do we know Elijah's... who his mom is? No, 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 no. We're, no, we don't know. Oh, okay. But essentially, in the scene before Elijah got out of his, of his tank. Uh huh. Not tank. He was a uh, cell. Sorry. Because they they needed Elijah mainly, because they wanted to use his his ripe first sieve DNA. Yeah. He's also a sage, by the way. Yeah, I think I knew that from something else. Like so. Like a... Anyway, yeah, he's like, no, actually, Juno, I don't like you. And so. Damn. I hope we see him in a game at some point. That'd be cool. He might be. He's probably in Valhalla. You think? I think so. I hope so. And the the reason why I say that is because the building collapses. Charlotte's fucking dead. And. Which is fine. We see Elijah was able to escape and he has the diamond with him at, at this time. Okay. So Elijah has the diamond. Charlotte's dead. R.I.P. Charlotte. Sad Titanic um, music on the flute. Juno is dead. So there you go. The the culmination of that plot was she gets stabbed and dies. Which I mean, I guess I'm not gonna ask about how you can be a virus and then you're but you're you've got the personality and power of your past first civilization Isu self, and then you get put into a body, but that like virus digital version of you does not remain at all. And this regular, supposedly human body, or maybe it's human with first sieve, you know, crossbreeding right. DNA. Right. Well, yeah, it's it's crossbreeded with 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 Elijah Miles's DNA, the shroud, and then Juno. So yeah, I know, like I know people who have read the comic or listened to this. I want to, I like, I kind of breezed over a lot of stuff. But look, there's not a lot of meat in this book. And if I got anything wrong, tell me that I'm stupid in the comments. Just <laughs> send us some hate mail to our our YouTube comment section. But that is essentially the 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 like the 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 uh the skeleton of it is the assassin templars are like, "Whoa, what the fuck is going on here? They work together. They find Juno trying to be resurrected by the instruments. They kill all the instruments basically in the process where so they're all gone. Juno's resurrected. She gets stabbed by Charlotte. The building collapses. The only thing is it ends very abruptly. Like, Kiyoshi, Chet, Galena, they're all just, like, around this army of Templars. So I don't know how the fuck they got out of that. Hmm. So maybe you could shed some light. I don't think I can, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can do that. Um, all right. So I think that sets us up. Uh, you know, Juno's been dealt with. Enter, enter Layla Hassan. She's Egyptian. She's a lesbian. Um, she's... You know, kind of got that like take no shit attitude, and she's working for Abstergo. She is in Egypt. Her mission in Egypt is to recover 
uh, some shit. I think an artifact or something. But she has a portable animus that she invented herself because she's also the coolest, smartest ever. And this portable animus is allowing her to use that artifact to relive the memories of Bayek of Siwa. Um, she is doing this with the help of her best friend, Deanna Geary, who only communicates with her via like phone slash earpiece slash radio, whatever, and who's chilling in a hotel because she prefers to have air conditioning. And the cool thing about Deanna is that like a lot of the modern day voice actors, she punches the shit out of her lines every time. So like, if Layla's overheard like talking to herself or talking about something, Deanna will be like, who are you talking to? <laughs> and you know, like Layla's like, time to do a leap of faith. And Deanna's like, leap of what? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, um, I've taken the liberty of compiling a sequence of all of Deanna's most harsh line punches. And I'm going to send it to you over Twitter right now. Layla, wakey wakey. So? How did it go? Amazing. Well, this time you lit the book on fire and then stomped on it. Who are you talking to? Bayek's mummy. Real chatterbox, that one. A second mummy? Oh, man. We should really report to Abstergo. What is it? Leap of what? <laughs> there you are, thank God. Leap of what? Uh, okay, you're making less and less sense, Leela. We need to report. Not yet. Not yet? So when? <laughs> Why? Yeah, well, I'm worried. Wake up! Layla, now! I need you! There's a van in the alleyway! Why is she so... Oh, God! What the fuck? They must have found out about... Oh, shit! Fuck! Please! No! Come on, Khadala. D? Oh, D. Who? What is this character's name? Uh, Deanna Geary. And you you might be thinking to yourself, I'm gonna Google who acts her. But you can't. Because there is no credited <laughs> actress. You can't because it's played by Darby Devitt. They have not accepted voice credit. They're one of the like 75% of voice actors on the game that are credited as additional voices, and we have no way of knowing who she is. Oh man, dude, that was something else. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> that is some like the room tier acting, I feel like. Man, no wonder she didn't want to be credited. <laughs> I wouldn't either if I was her. Um <laughs> You know, so at one point Layla's like, if this doesn't convince Abstergo to give me a place on the Animus Project, nothing will. So she has a clear motive. She's working for Abstergo. She wants to be put on the Animus Project, which I think is just the catch-all term for people who develop Animus technology. You'd think she'd be a great fit there, considering she pulled a portable Animus out of her ass <laughs> that she says has more computing power than NASA and CERN combined. Okay, cool. Um... <laughs> It's also implied over email conversations you can read that she has something of a romantic relationship with Sophia Riken. Remember her from the yeah. movie? Yeah. Layla, you know, she in her own words, in her own words, she doesn't work by the book. She's a maverick. Um, she's kind of mean to this Deanna lady too. She's always calling her a dork and basically telling her to shut the hell up, which I kind of <laughs> I understand. I it. understand that one. It's like it's like my dynamic with you. <laughs> Yeah. You know, fuck you, Tim. Shut the hell up, Tim. It's it's abusive, but in a charming way. Yeah. It's a love-hate. Yeah. Basically, everything that happens in these little modern-day interludes is this very forced kind of conflict where the writers have to invent something for them to argue about so that you feel like a story is happening. Layla, go find the medicine so you don't die from being in the animus too long. Layla, if you try to cross between memory streams, it could be dangerous and unpredictable for some reason. But imagine all that in, like, a high-pitched Canadian wine voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, then some Abstergo goons show up. Deanna has that full on shit fit meltdown over the phone trying to warn Layla about it, and Layla has to assassinate them all. It's unclear why this is happening. Layla works for Abstergo, mind you, and they don't like walk up and attack Layla. They all just stand around outside the door of her hideout looking away from the hideout so you can sneak up and kill them from behind. And Layla's like, I have to do this. It's them or me. But I have no idea why. So I checked the wiki for some clarity on this, and it does not offer much. It says <laughs> Layla's refusal to check in with Abstergo, which, okay, that, like, is a thing that happens, because, you know, in that uh, montage, Deanna's like, we should check in. And Layla's like, not yet. 
Why it would be advantageous to her not to check in, I don't know. She works for this company. She is trying to advance in this company, right? So instead, these guards come, and the stated reason for them showing up is that they're trying to find them because they haven't checked in, which doesn't sound like a, a we're going to kill you type offense. She just murks all of them. <laughs> Lying to your superiors and then killing them when they investigate it seems like an awfully <laughs> strange way to accomplish that goal. <laughs> After she, she finishes her animus shenanimous, she wakes up to find William Miles sitting creepily in a folding lawn chair next to her animus. He's <laughs> like, wow, you've done a real good job with this animus stuff. Want to come hang out with me and the cool kids gang? If you stay here, Abstergo probably kills you, considering you've, you know, you've killed a lot of their guys. <laughs> It'll be great. The assassins are all about freedom, ice cream, and good vibes. <laughs> She's like, all right, fuck it. <laughs> they escape in a helicopter. And uh, William Miles in this moment famously is not voiced by John Delancey, so what was the point? Um, <laughs> Odyssey comes in. <laughs> I did... <laughs> I just remember. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go for it. What are you thinking? I just remember what you said yesterday. You're like, yeah, I get it. John Delancey is not going to show up for a cameo. He's an actual actor. He was on Star Trek and My Little Pony. <laughs> I forgot I said that. <laughs> it's true. John Delancey doesn't need Star Trek. He's on. He's on. Doesn't need. Did I just say Star Trek? Doesn't need <laughs> Assassin's Creed. He's on he Star, Trek Star Trek. He doesn't need Star Trek. He's on My Little Pony. My Little Pony. <laughs> <laughs> um. <clears throat> anyway, yeah. sorry. So Odyssey. Um. Do you feel like you understand Origins? Do you feel like you get what happened in it? Yeah, she was a Stargo employee trying to trying to impress her bosses. They try and. She kills them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's and literally Miles... finding the origins of the Assassin Brotherhood. You'd think that would be of some value to the Templars and that she could make a case. She could be like, yeah, hey. that's that's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I get it. So far, so good. Um, Odyssey picks up in a dingy office in London. Layla comes out of the Animus and now she has another screechy line punching best friend named Victoria Bibobobo. Um, only this one's actually in the room with her and not just over the phone. So that's perhaps a step up, um, between this Deanna and the assassin lady in gold, Michelle, uh, it seems like the only person Ubisoft knows how to write for AC modern day female supporting characters is shouting. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure how I feel about that. I guess Alana is okay. She has some voice stuff. Is Alana in the comics? Alana Ryan. I'm not familiar. Kiyoshi and Alana are also part of their merry band of assassins, but you don't see them on screen at all. So they are purely over radio voice chat. <clears throat> There's a conversation they have in optional dialogue choices that references both the Nikolai comics and Brahmin. So that's neato. Yeah. They talk about how Tesla had a staff of Eden of some kind that exploded. Um, and they talk about how this version of the animus that Layla has whipped up is like, brahmin type i think they say which i don't think is true or logical but i'll accept the name drop i will um if you dear listener don't know what we're talking about we have a couple episodes in our back catalog about the fall the chain and brahmin so give those a listen if you um are lost <clears throat> then so in the past while you're playing as cassandra you discover the sealed off city of atlantis which is guarded by pythagoras as in the guy the Pythagorean theorem, right? Pythagoras is there, who is 150 years old because he is a staff that makes him immortal, okay? And he's also Cassandra's real father. Whoa! Yeah. So <laughs> he's her dad, and he's like, here, I want you to have this immortality staff. She's like, cool. Um, you wake up, and you're like, as Layla, and you're like, hey, Victoria, we, uh, we, we found Atlantis. <laughs> Let's go there. And you do. So you go in while Victoria and Alana and Kyoshi, they kick it on the Altair 2. After you putz around in the sealed off Atlantis room, you do some puzzle shenanigans to try to unseal it, but you can't. So then Cassandra shows up wearing a suit to help you out. She's got the immortality staff and has existed for centuries now. How how do you feel about this, Tim? Uh it kind of it kind of it kind of makes it weird, though, that she wouldn't have popped up in any of our other Assassin's Creed games if she was an immortal warrior. I agree. 
It's kind of weird. And I feel like we probably will see her. Like, I think they'll, they'll pop her into Valhalla or something. Cause you know, there's like a, there's a, a cameo flash of Aya in Odyssey, uh, implying that Cassandra is an ancestor of Aya from right. origins. So I feel like if they just want to like, Hey, remind you of the character that was in our last game, Valhalla will probably have like Cassandra running around somewhere. What if you can romance Cassandra? In Valhalla? <laughs> That'd be great. I saw the actress who plays Cassandra in a terrible, shitty Netflix. Oh comedy. yeah. Will Ferrell movie. Yeah. That my mom was watching in the living room and I was just catching part of it. It's called Eurovision song contest. The story of fire saga. That is the title of the movie. It's two hours long, <laughs> but Will Ferrell does have sex with, uh, with Cassandra in that movie. You know, Assassin's Creed right now is all about letting you fuck anyone and everyone, but they won't let you fuck yourself. <laughs> exactly. There's no interactive masturbation in Assassin's Creed. I'm not Creed a fan. Yet. We'll get there one day. We will. Now, okay, so as soon as Cassandra hands the staff to Layla, she starts to just rapidly age and die immediately. So now I'm kind of wondering, and I don't know why this is the first time I've wondered about this since I've played the game twice. Um, she... Do you have to be touching the staff at all times to stay immortal? <laughs> do you? Well, I th- do you have to sleep <laughs> cradling it, like shower with it? Because that's the only way this scene makes sense to me. What I think it, what I think happened probably is she like relinquished ownership to it. So if I keep the staff in my bedroom and run around the world, I will just never die. Yeah, it's yeah, I, I I see what you're saying. It's definitely like uh, yeah, it's like, a little unclear. Like she let she lets go of it and she you know yeah. ages a hundred thousand years. And so dies, I want to but... see Layla let go of it and also die. I mean, she wouldn't because she's not lived but she that ages long. like five minutes. So that's pretty much it for the modern day in Odyssey, which is not really like a story arc at all. It's just they arrive in Atlantis and then they're there. That's how it ends. They just arrive at Atlantis. No, I mean, yeah, they've been. They, yeah, she explores Atlantis. Then there's you could consider the Cassandra thing being the end of the modern day story, even though it's not like they really accomplished anything. Like they don't get into Atlantis really. They save that for the DLC, <clears throat> which I believe has Woo! more modern day content in it than the base game. So it's revealed in a wire conversation between Layla and Alana that Sigma team, led by our friend Juhani Atso Berg. Uh, found the Altair 2 and spied on their conversations. Layla's like, cool. And then she meets an ESO hologram named Alethea. Victoria shows up and she's like, are you sure we can trust the hologram lady? Then after an animus session concludes, a band of Abstergo goons rolls in and you have to fight them. Um, And basically what's happening in this modern day story is that Layla is undergoing these trials through Alexios or Cassandra in the past learning what they learn when they undergo the trials to, I guess, become bonded or paired with the spear somehow so that it keeps them alive and works for them. Um, <clears throat> Layla's about to, in this fight with all these Abstergo goons, she's killed two of them and she's about to skewer the last of the guards when Victoria gives her the, rut row, you're killing people? Kind of routine. And right. Layla's like, adoy, they're here to kill us. Victoria's like, there was no reason to massacre them, which I think she just gave you one, actually, Victoria. But no, this DLC story has to make a big deal about how Layla is being morally corrupted. So suddenly these assassins have to have a real issue with the idea of killing Templar bad guys, right? So that's fun and clever and original and cool. I love that. So good. (laughs) Did you just kill people? <laughs> Did you just kill the people that were trying to kill Did me? Did you, assassin, just kill people? <laughs> Episode two of the DLC picks up. Layla and Victoria, there's... How many episodes is there? There's three. Oh, wow. They're still figuring out... They really were trying to milk you out of some money, huh? Layla and Victoria are figuring out the Atlantis stuff. Layla's like, wow, all this uh, connecting myself with the staff is really making me feel like a million bucks. It's a real spider-man 3 symbiote suit situation because she's just loving it she feels powerful she feels strong and victoria's like i'm your doctor this shit is changing you layla and she basically thinks that the staff and the bleeding effect from entering demos's memories demos the the villain of uh, odyssey who's the other sibling you don't play as she thinks it's turning layla into a violent psychopath at one point at the towards the end of the episode as she's now gone through two-thirds of the trials, uh, Victoria's like, this has gone too far. 
It's me or the staff. You have to choose. So Layla pulls the staff out of Victoria's hand and then viciously bludgeons her in the head with it, sending her flying back like 30 feet, which is cool because, you know, that's what you do when you have an argument with somebody. Uh, you just yeah. you smack them in the head with a powerful precursor artifact. Then Layla walks over to Victoria's battered corpse and she's like, ha, I'm just playing. Get up, Victoria. Victoria, get up. <laughs> hey, Victoria. Any day now, Victoria. Victoria? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> now Alethea shows up and she's like, wow, Layla, you're a real piece of shit. The heir of memories would never do this. And Layla's like, I didn't do it. It was the staff. The staff did it. I don't kill people. The staff kills people. So Alethea's like, we should we should take a break. We should stop seeing each other. Episode three. Layla's like, all right, I'm ready to finish my training now with the staff. Alethea's like, yeah, so the whole part where I deemed you the heir of memories and waited centuries for your arrival and got you two-thirds of the way through training to pair with the staff and be the next immortal demigod, turns out the whole you part of that was a miscalculation on my part. So uh, never mind, you should just leave Atlantis and never come back. Now we're back in the land of very forced conflict, this time between Layla and Alethea. She's like, oh, you know, <clears throat> your body and mind are too weak. Your DNA is too human. You're, you're not going to withstand the third simulation in the process. It's not entirely clear why the staff that makes you immortal would also, A, require you to, like, train with and pair yourself to it, and B, take over your body and force you to do evil things. There's no reason why that would happen. It's just, like, a convenient thing to be like, oh, it's the fucking, you know, Dr. Octopus arms from Spider-Man 2. It's taking over your body, <laughs> making you do evil shit. Well, yeah, because the, because the inhibitor the chip. The inhibitor fried. chip. Basically, we, we designed sentient robot arms, and we put a tiny little glass button on it to keep it from <laughs> controlling your mind. Um, I don't know why the staff is like this. I'm not sure there's a great explanation. Um, after all this back and forth techno babble arguing Layla's like can I go back to the do the third trial pretty please with a cherry on top and Lathia's like fine <laughs> <laughs> after fucking around in the past with some Elysium Juno shenanigans Layla awakens having had her memories interrupted by the arrival of Otso Berg he's like interrogating her in the little Atlantis chamber Layla's like what if I use the staff to heal your daughter with cystic fibrosis. And he's like, shut your goddamn mouth. <laughs> She's fighting with him. She starts being all like villainous and shit. She's like, mm, you know, my favorite part of the staff mm, being immortal. <laughs> wow. And then she skewers him in the fucking gut. Just fucking with the staff. Yeah. With the staff. I, is she not handcuffed? No. Wow, I guess so when I said interrogating, sloppy. it's less that he's interrogating. Like, he has no power. He just walks in and they're talking to each other before they fight. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, he's like, wow, <laughs> you're a piece of shit, uh, Layla. And she's like, fuck you, Atso. <laughs> like, it's okay. A standoff would be a better description of what's happening. Okay. I just, it's so funny to me that Otso Berg just walks and he's like, hey, fuck yeah, you. Yeah, that's basically what it is. He's like, hmm, <laughs> you know how you're an assassin and I'm a Templar? That makes me hate you. And she was like, damn, bro, that shit sucks. What if I healed your daughter with cystic fibrosis? Okay, so she impales she him. She impales him, like, straight up, like, death wound. He's lying motionless on the floor of the little chamber. I thought he was dead in that moment, which I was about to be really pissed off by because it would be such a bitch death for, like, <clears throat> one of the only characters left who's, like, consistently showing up in things and has been around a while. Yeah. And, like, has development and interesting characterization for him to be gone because of Layla, of all things, would be kind of like watching Charlotte Delacruz stab Juno to death. <laughs> Layla crouches over Victoria's dead husk, which is still just chilling there in the chamber. Evan, she's not even, like, throwing her in the water or anything. She's just letting that corpse decay right in there. She's like, man, I'm really, I'm, I'm really sorry I killed you. Remember when you cooked me dinner one time? I'm sorry I said you couldn't cook. I didn't paraphrase that. That's, that's what she says. Really? That's what she says to her dead friend, who she killed because they were arguing. I'm sorry I said you can't cook. How about sorry for fucking murdering her, Layla? <laughs> you fucking psychopath. 
All right, have it your way. I like your cooking. Then she uh, she she takes the comms unit off of Victoria's ear because hers doesn't work for some reason, but Victoria's does. And Alana's like, oh, Victoria, I'm glad to hear from you. And Layla's like, oh, this is Layla. And Alana's like, why are you using Victoria's comms unit? And she's like, oh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Uh, we got the artifact. I finished the trials. Otto Burger's having a nap. We can talk about the whole Victoria thing later, I guess. And that's pretty much where it ends. That's it? That's it. Okay, so Otto Berg is, like, presumed dead. I think he's at least in assassin captivity. He's clearly alive. Like, they show him breathing, and she's like, yeah, he's, he's, t- yeah, he's, he's still breathing. Yeah, but what I hate is there's no explanation about, like, how the fuck did they get out of the desert without all the Templars just murdering them? Like, how did they get out of Egypt? No, 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 from Uprising. Because last we saw them, it was Otso, Berg, Galena, Kiyoshi, Chet, and they were just, like, all standing outside of the base where Charlotte just died, and that's it. Like, they don't escape. Like, how the fuck did they get out of that? Oh, uh, that is not addressed in the games at all. No. By the time we're in Odyssey, they've all, they're all ganging out in a London, like, cell, basically. Oh. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, so as you can see, the problem with Assassin's Creed Modern Day is that it's dumb and bad and also incoherent and also stupid. Wow. Yeah. I really wasn't missing out on much, huh? <laughs> Neither was I, I guess. I mean, I would have liked to see some familiar faces in that comic. Seems like they do a little who's who of whoever's still around, but they're still doing such a terrible job of making the actual stakes of the cl- conflict clear. Because technically the assassins, the fact that they now have this staff, they talk about it like it's a big win. I'm not sure what it actually strategically accomplishes for them, but I mean, that's all these games sometimes are is like, let's find the magic thing before they do. But it and... literally is like a, like an AC gold. They're like back to being like the underdogs. But in Uprising, you know, they're like these super tactical, awesome superheroes. Yeah. They can't. They they aren't clear about what the actual relationship is in terms of like who's winning, what's at stake, what are they trying to accomplish anymore? Because for a lot of these pieces of Eden, it's not clear how, you know, how would the Templars use this to enslave the world? How would the assassins use it to free the world? What's going to happen then? There's also a lot of what I know would personally bother the shit out of you is sort of butchering of like the assassin mindset because specifically in or in Odyssey. Layla says something to Alethea about, you know, I used to fight for order, but now I fight for freedom and chaos. Oh, <laughs> I'm cool. like, I don't think that's what the assassins are. Yeah, not, chaos too, sounds a little. Mm. Yeah, that sounds a little much. Sounds a little over the top. J- Joker. What, what's going on? <laughs> um, Why are you so serious? Yeah. We both talked in the last episode about how we really enjoyed the syndicate modern day. So we don't really need to rehash a lot of those opinions, but. You know, I I used to have a lot of, and I know you did too, a lot of like expectations of, I mean, we spent a good few years like desperate for playable modern day and they've given us playable modern day and it's, it's, it's worse. It's more garbage. Yeah. I mean, that's a big part of what, like, that's a big part of of what was keeping me from playing the games also. Yeah. was like, okay, cool. Playable modern day is back, but is it even close to Syndicate quality? No. And. I, I, I reference Syndicate so much because, like, Syndicate was, like, the last time where Modern Day, like, impressed me. And I've gone back and we watched the Syndicate Modern Day, like, a few times since I've played it. I can't say that for a lot of the Modern Day sequences throughout the series, even the good ones. Yeah. So, Syndicate did something right. Yeah. And the thing is, is it was, like, everyone was, all the characterization of the characters were correct. Yeah. Like, Otto Berg was Otto Berg, Galena was Galena, Sean mm-hmm. was Sean, Rebecca was Rebecca. Yeah. And that was because I think it was Yohalem. Yeah. So now that Darby's back, I'm thinking he will inject some like coherence in these characters, you know? I mean, if he's bringing back Rebecca, that's a good sign, you know, that he's... Like, because really, what, when you do an inventory of, like, what does Assassin's Creed have as far as characters and story elements that we really want to see more of, Right. And I think we do want to see more of Sean and Rebecca because they're the OGs. And it makes us yeah. happy when we see them and, and we see them Miles done well. For me. We want to see uh, Otto Berg because he's a good villain and he's been well characterized and developed for many years now. What yeah, even... I, you know, I think we need a shift to like, 
the 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 uphill battle that they're facing is now that Assassin's Creed has existed for so long in so many different arcs and so many different forms of media, the story that you can tell about someone getting recruited to the assassins is 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 limited because every time they do the same exact shtick of like here's a nobody that has this deep lineage that's getting pulled in which we've already seen with Desmond, Callum, Charlotte, uh Aaliyah, I think whoever the main character of Gold is. I don't want to see that again, <clears throat> you know, obviously, cuz that'd be boring. We'd be like why should I care about this character? But I, they still need to treat them like characters and they still need to give us reasons to care about them because Layla has no personality and no traits that you typically look for to make a character likable. She doesn't have a struggle that's relatable. She doesn't have a, a goal that's relatable. And it's really hard to be emotionally engaged with her because... She's pretty boring and she's pretty annoying and I don't like her. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think a lot of the problems of the modern day has been very well litigated and it's just, I don't, I don't know if they care so much anymore. When you get a guy like Darby, obviously they're going to care, but I'm worried that that's not a priority anymore because they always like to talk like it is. They always like to talk like modern day is this big deal of them because it's a big deal to us. It isn't. I don't believe that anymore. And, and hey, when... The the guy who did the soundtrack for Syndicate, he was on a podcast recently, and someone sent me a, a sent us a clip of him basically saying, you know, he was talking to the producers, he was talking to Ubisoft, you know, I know how you want it to sound for the past, but um, if I make compositions for the present day storyline and the sci fi stuff, should that stay pretty close to what I'm doing in the past, or should that be different? Like he's trying to ask thoughtful questions about what the music landscape of the of the modern day should look like and they were like dude no one cares <laughs> bro dude fuck off dude fuck out of the modern day dude people just want to play the historical shit they don't care about the modern day so just make the map bigger don't even make any music for it <laughs> you know what just don't even make a soundtrack for it we'll just use the music from the from the past uh, they, and day. according to Austin Wintory, they just didn't use music at all. Now w they did use his song that he made for Syndicate underground over the, yes. over the but battle, it, but it fit. which is a very memorable and effective moment in the modern day. Um, and it's, it's part of what makes it so awesome is yeah. that cool song and that cool fight sequence. I gotta say that whole sequence is probably the best. I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it. It's the best modern day we've ever seen. That sequence right there, the underground sequence. Absolutely. Without a so doubt. So I, I don't know. If I, you I, disagree, I, send us a hate mail, please. Well, if you disagree, you need to provide me with facts as to you why you You need to disagree. provide me with facts and logic about why, <laughs> why Syndicate isn't the best modern day. And you can say, well, it's not playable. And I'll say, shut up. Yeah, I can't. And it, it, since that happened, I can no longer agree that modern day has to be playable to be good. Absolutely. It just has to have good characterization and momentum yeah and it's like when layla pisses around in atlantis for you know an hour or whatever like that doesn't that doesn't matter to me exactly yeah it we need stakes we need characters that we like we need you know personal stakes with desmond it was really easy to relate to a guy who's been plucked out of his normal life as a bartender and now he's the center of a global conspiracy and a conflict that has existed for centuries when he feels despondent when he feels down on on himself and and that we we relate because boy if if i was in his shoes i'd i'd go through the same struggle and he wants to be great because he has all these expectations placed upon him is it a, a pretty bog standard like chosen one narrative yes but there's a reason that you can give us Star Wars and Harry Potter and do the Chosen One thing over and over again and we'll enjoy it because it's it's effective. I don't want to see them do it again, but I want to see them do something that is effective, right? Elijah Miles, from what you're saying, kind of sounds like an interesting setup to a character. He's kind of grown up in this conflict and had an interesting role in it now. What What is he going to grow up to be like is my question because if you, if you come back to him and he's... 17 now or whatever like what does his life look like at this point he's not really being raised by anyone his parents are dead um and his whole life has been part of this crazy you know situation i want to know what what he's going to be up to 
I imagine that William Miles is trying is going to try and track him down. He didn't care much about his son, sense. so I'm not sure he'll care much about his grandson. William Miles? Yeah. What do you mean? Since when? I mean, he seemed like a pretty shitty father. <laughs> I mean, he was he was a tough he was tough, but he obviously that's like, what AC three mourning... was kind of about. Well, he's obviously mourning Desmond. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but I think maybe that would be a fuel for him to have an interesting relationship with Elijah if he feels like he fucked it up with Desmond. Yeah, he could, he could be like, "I'm going to raise you." Like, like I'm going to do this myself. the way I should have raised Desmond. That could be cool. And you know, like Ubisoft, every time I ask them to do something, every time I think, "Wow, it would be cool if they do this," they do it bad. <laughs> they do it worse than you thought. They do it worse than I ever thought they could have. I'm like, they should make a movie. I'm like, they should bring back playable modern day. I'm like, they should make these games more like The Witcher. <laughs> Everything I ask them to do, they do poorly. So they're, by this, by that logic, they're going to bring Elijah into it, and he's going to be the dumbest, most unlikable, most unrelatable and stupid character we've ever seen in the modern day. I can't wait. Layla has set a pretty low bar, but he'll come under it somehow. Well, fuck. We know that Valhalla, we've got these animus anomalies. They're going to try and clearly be doing something kind of interesting, I guess, maybe a little bit. You can exit the animus, and clearly you're going somewhere and talking to someone in the real world at some point. I have no hope for Layla to suddenly be good or interesting. Like that's, I mean, she is who she is. And I don't think even Darby could make me care about her at this point. So really the only thing I can hope for is that Valhalla completely closes the book on Layla's story and maybe even kills her. And then we can start fresh next year. You know, that would be great. That'd be all I can ask for at this point. I'm almost, I'm almost team reboot at this point. Like, this continuity is so fucked. Let's just it is wipe fucked. it out. And, and I, I, I hate to say it because I'm, I, I'm okay with yearly releases when it's good. But at this point, it's like we have so much. I just, I just, I want a clean slate. I want the good shit to come back. And I want the bad shit to go away. It's become really hard for someone telling an Assassin's Creed story to have any sort of new perspective on the conflict. On the, I think to the point where, as we've seen for the last few games. The best strategy in their mind is to get rid of it entirely and not talk about assassins or Templars, you know? How do we, like, that That can only be the result of the people working on these games, of the people working on these games feeling burdened by those, those tenets of the franchise and wanting to just escape it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm TV, I'm, I am Team Reboot right there with you. I don't know what I would want to see in a reboot that would be substantially different from what we have. Like, I don't want them to just do the same story again, soft reboot, full reboot or otherwise. Like I don't want, you know, your average bartender gets sucked into a world he doesn't understand, but I do want them to have maybe the freedom to create new mysteries and create new intrigue because there's no facet of the Assassin's Creed world that we know about that we don't fully understand by now. We understand all the factions. We understand the pieces of Eden. We understand the Isu pretty damn well. We understand uh, the sages and everything. Like, I have no burning questions. But when I send myself back in my mind to playing AC2, you know, learning the truth, it's like it took to that game to really understand how much the conflict had permeated through all of history the possibilities that it opened up for what you could do with history and with the franchise were immense. And those little nuggets of information that we were getting about the precursors, about the Isu were fascinating because it is mysterious to imagine that there's a whole precursor race that came before us and what did they do and what were they about and why aren't they around anymore? But now all those questions have more or less been answered. Yeah. I mean, they blew their load. Yeah. But it's, but like, Especially coming out year after year, they're like, okay, well, just give them a little bit more first sip. And then they stopped caring. You're like, okay, just give them all the first sip, whatever. And also, when you have all these different development teams, they don't want to play off of what, you know, the last group did. So they just keep doing their own different things. I wonder who, if, if it's like Azazia Amar or whatever is the, the head of transmedia. Like, I want to know who makes the call. Who's like, you know what? Juno, don't bother with it. We'll do it in a comic. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I want to know who pushes that button, right? And why? Where they go, oh, new players will be too overwhelmed by all this back context. Let's just get rid of it. I think they've proven time and time again that they have no real capability of setting up something and then paying it off. Valhalla is going to give us more Layla at least. It's going to have maybe Rebecca in it, rumoredly. What what, what would they have to do to redeem themselves in your eyes? Uh, give us give us a main character to follow. Yeah. Like, obviously, uh, as a, you know, showing in Syndicate, it could be a cast of characters. Just put us on the Altair 2 and leave us there. Let us deal with those people. Let us, you know, hang like let us hang out with those people. I don't, I don't need, I don't know. I, I, I think I, I always thought that a good modern day would set us with a new main character on the Altair too. We can go around and interact with different assassins on the boat, go do missions with them, all that stuff. I think that would be what I want ideally in a playable modern day. Here's my radical pitch for modern day. Are you ready? Yes. Set a modern day story in the past, not like the distant past. But they've had animus technology that we've seen in the 40s, in the 80s, in the 2000s that was all differently capable. I think maybe putting us in like the 80s in a really like beige, blocky 80s animus with like a young Warren Vidic, I think that could be cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, like I, you know, hey, I actually think that'd be really fun. Like, like, like a subject one or some shit. I think uh, Galena, her mother was like, there was a story in, in Initiates or something that her mom yeah. was in an 80s animus prison sort of situation basically and yeah. the descriptions of it were pretty haunting it sounded like a pretty nasty and and mentally psychologically fucking ridiculous place to be a lot of the best stories about the animus and about the modern day have really leaned into the psychological horror of the idea of having you be pasted to this bed for hours reliving the memories of your ancestors what would that do to your mind lean into that go a little psychological horror on us in assassin's creed we can take it we're grown-ups Get a little creepy with it. Why not? I want to see an 80s animus as the quote-unquote modern-day overarching storyline and use it to maybe unlock some insights about the origins of the animus, tell some interesting stories about what they were really up to at that time, why they thought this was a good idea, you know? Yeah. I mean, if anything, that would work as a, as, as a like, comic akin to like The Fall. Absolutely. Or, alternatively, what would be really cool is if I'm just playing a video game on the Helix server and I'm the main character and then this lady like named Bishop or something could just, I don't know, say words at me in cutscenes. I mean, it does sound pretty dope, actually. I actually that'd, like be that. cool. that'd be yeah. cool, right? <laughs> I would take it over this Layla shit. I would. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll, I'll say it right now. Unity Modern Day, better than Origins Modern Day. You can find me about it. I'm laying it down. It's not good. They're both very bad, but at least one of them didn't pretend to be better than it was. This has been both fascinating and exhausting, Timothy. Yeah, I'm going to go take a nap. Yeah, I'm going to take a fat nap. In the meantime, you guys can send us some hate mail in our in our comment section. Yeah, guys, make sure that uh, make sure I didn't miss anything. From Uprising. Yeah, uh, please go through everything we said and, and just anything important that you feel like we left out. Correct us as condescendingly and and aggressively as you can in the comments. We would yeah, and enjoy that. Yeah, tweet me that. say that I'm a fool. Tweet, tweet at us and call us losers. Like the video if you're on YouTube. Comment if you're on YouTube. If you're on Spotify, I mean, good for you. Just fuck off. Just leave. Just I mean, we, there's <laughs> nothing you can provide us without you navigating to the YouTube and doing yeah. something there. But hey, there are a lot of ways you can uh, support what we're doing on our show. You can retweet our clips that we post on our Twitter pretty much every week of our, our highlighted moments. Um, and if you have friends who like Assassin's Creed and like podcasts, you can let them know what we're doing and send them a, a cheeky little link and see what happens. See, see how it goes. All right. I think that does it. Me too. I, I, I've been the blade. I've been the hook. Thanks for listening.
need a blade. So you can use one or the other, or the other, or the other, or the other, or the other.